agree that the myth is definitely there that ML is a solution or even now they call it AI. Like AI is a solution to everything. And the reason I say this is a myth is because... In today's episode, we have Sankit, who is a senior machine learning engineer at Spotify. Welcome, Sankit. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so first of all, you your background was in electrical engineering. You studied that and then you switched to machine learning. Tell us more about what motivated this shift. Yeah, I can uh, dig into it. So I'm actually from a background which is more on the circuit design and analog uh, design of chips and things like that. I worked on it for a number of years, uh, building chips for power management, uh, basically, which go into a laptop and phones kind of like to build a stable power supply. That was a very interesting field. But when I came to do my master's at Columbia University, I started taking these different kinds of courses, so like things like astronomy, genetics, and so on. And in those kind of courses, I realized kind of the value of data and how much value big data analysis and pattern recognition can, can provide in those fields, right? That's kind of like excited and, and like got me interested in this field of data science and machine learning. The deep learning wave was just starting. And at that time, like I could get some hands-on experience with some of this stuff. And that's kind of motivated, propelled me into this area, obviously. Yeah, so this is all pretty new to me too. I think for the audience, it'd be helpful to kind of break down these pretty large umbrella areas of study. So you talked about data science, machine learning, deep learning. Maybe kind of break these down. Like when a lot of people think about the, I think a lot of it comes down like what you're saying, the value of the data, understanding out of the data. So there's data science and then machine learning. If people are thinking about a career path and either one of those two paths, like how would you highlight the differences or similarities between the data science and machine learning? Sure. That's actually a great question. It's something that people should think about much more than, than what I see. Like so I see people apply to both data science and ML, right? And I, I understand, I think it's also an artifact of the industry where so these two terms can be used interchangeably. At least that was the case four or five years back where like data scientists were also doing ML. And some ML people were doing data science, right? So it, it was a little bit like, like that. But I think right now in 2024, we are in a place where I think we are very distinct. And that's kind of what I see at Spotify also. And the way I see that kind of the difference is that data scientists tend to do a lot of like data analysis, data augmentation, setting up A-B tests, doing statistical analysis of the A-B tests. Whether the test is powered, whether there is enough statistical value to an online A-B test. Right? So those are the kind of things I see data scientists doing. And I see all these ML practitioners converging more on like building and shipping ML models, right? And data scientists tend to be people like who are kind of around this, right? So they either do insights, they do which model to actually build, which features may be helpful, right? And then they do the online A-B testing, the static scale, right? So they kind of are now converging around outside the ML, core ML, and, and a lot of the core ML is now being done by ML practice. So when you transitioned into, from your backgrounds from electrical engineering into the field of data science, machine learning. You went to school for this. You mentioned you went to Columbia for your graduate school. Do you think that is like the most likely path for people that want to get into this field? Or have you seen other paths that other colleagues or friends in the space have gotten into, have broken into data science or machine, machine learning? Yeah, I think there are like a couple of parts, right? One is to go to school and then just take lots of courses, right? But at the time, I think, Going to school, like a real, like brick and mortar school was kind of important because there were not a lot of resources on ML. I think Andrew Young's ML course was, I think, the de facto course at the time. That was like the one course. But now I see like a lot of like universities, MIT, Stanford, a lot of different universities putting stuff out there. So it's much easier for people to grab and, and learn things, right? Um, so in terms of learning, I don't see any reason to go to school just for switching to the field, right? You can learn through Coursera, through, through Udemy, Udacity, whatever it may be. Like there are many, many programs out there. But in terms of like breaking through in the field, I feel like there are two parts. One is to join a startup, which may be doing stuff in your area. So say you are maybe like an aer aerospace engineer, right? And you join a startup which is doing say building planes or whatever. And in that area, you go and you start seeing value of data, pattern recognitions, ML, and you kind of start gaining some of 
this new stuff there and it will be of much more value right like it, like it's a field which doesn't really traditionally have a lot of like data science and ml and you can bring a lot of value at the same time you will be learning on the ground right so that's one one part right so you bring your hard skills to a startup or a company which is very new in this area so that's one way and the second way i feel is to join a large company right so that's a completely different approach you join a big tech company as a software engineer or a backend engineer or whatever that may be and you start learning ml you take these courses and then you switch to ml inside a big tech company right so these are the two paths kind of i see being taken by my friends and colleagues i like that, that there's kind of two approaches and it can either it can work that whether you are at a big tech company or startup there's different paths to get into there so it sounds like a big part of this if you were not to go the brick and mortar university route is to self study can you tell us more about like what the coursework is like if you were to have specific courses or specific topics that you needed to really either refresh or to to learn for the first time that's required to become a machine learning engineer? Sure, yeah, that's a really good question. A lot of people ask me this, and I think like there are a lot of great ML courses, but ML is changing, right? It's like every one or two years, and now it's an LLM way. Three four years back, it was like ML ops, and like one that was getting popular before that deep learning, and it's it's like. Every two years or so, there is something new, right? And how do you actually prepare for it? And taking kind of the first principles route here, I would say that if possible, you should take courses on things like algorithms, statistics, linear algebra, even hardware. So take a couple of courses on computing, GPUs, CUDA analysis. So like you kind of like making yourself basically learn all the fundamentals that are not going to change in the next 10 years. If you are actually, you're, there might be students listening to this as well. One thing I can say is, if you're in a brick and mortar university right now, doing all of these courses may, be, may place you in a better place than taking like the hottest thing. Right? So they may have like this LNM course right now, which is maybe fine as one course, but all of these fundamentals, I feel personally, are things that are really important to put you in a good state uh, when you do go, go into the industry. I like that there are certain things that don't change and you focus on those fundamentals. They won't be a waste of your time. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like maybe like the majority of things don't change, but maybe like let's say 10% of it does change. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps on changing over every two years, like you mentioned. What are those changes and how do you adapt or maybe foresee what those smaller uh, changes are that are unrelated to the fundamentals that you can try to prepare for? Yeah, I know. I understand like it may be job, these things might have like 10% being those unchanging things, 90% being LLMs and deep learning. And I understand kind of the realities of, of this, but how to well prepare for it is, is a good question. I think listening to a lot of podcasts, right? Like I think I, I do that quite a bit. Listening to people talk about things, their real life experiences, to me speak more than just some paper from Google, which says like we are 15% better in everything. Like those are also good papers to read, but I tend to learn a lot more from people from the industry who are actually trying things, who are failing in specific thoughts and not, and like, you kind of like start to put yourself in, the, in those shoes and in those situations and you start to think, okay, what could I do differently? What could I learn from them? Right. And this is a very applied approach where you kind of see the applications of these things day to day, you keep listening, following people. I think that would put in, in a good, good yeah. place. So would that, would that be like engineering blogs from like, like Spotify in this case, in, in your case, or from other big tech companies? Yeah. So like engineering blogs, Netflix, Pinterest, Spotify, like all of these companies have some really great blogs on recommender systems. That's kind of what I focus on personally. So those are the places I, I'd go there. Um, another thing which may help actually is for cutting edge stuff, right? I, I think some people in the audience may be interested like regarding cutting edge. That may not be easy to find in blogs and, and podcasts, right? So in that case. Having a peer group with like two or three people, right? Not, not too many, like two or three people. And you read some of these research papers together. That may be better than just doing it on your own, right? Like alone, reading 10, 20 pages of dense text with like 55, 60 formula is very difficult to focus and to, to go on like, because I know you have a number of things going on. Having two or three people, you can just divide up the paper, you teach each other's stuff. And teaching is, I think, the best form of learning. If you have the luxury and, and privilege to have those two or three people around you, I, I would really recommend that you pick 
and you divide and conquer in a way some of these big, massive, big papers, read them together, and then read some of the applied stuff. I think that to me is the best way to kind of keep catching up, like keep following the trends, basically. Yeah. So you mentioned this, this term, the, the applied like machine learning. Can you talk to us about like what that means? Like what is like the, I don't want to say the opposite of it, but it's like the more like theoretical stuff. Like what are the differences between applied machine learning and, and non-applied machine learning? Let me take an example here. I think that may help. So in terms of like applied basically means taking some academic research or some industrial research and applying it to real production business use case, right? So that's a definition. Now, let me take an example, right? So in, there might be papers out there which may say that like the graph machine learning is the best thing in the world for recommendation purposes, right? And they will have all these papers which prove, okay, like when you use graphs, you get this much gain on movie lens or Amazon books, data sets. So they will prove all this through theoretical means. But the applied part of it is to take that and put it in industry, right? And when you actually start doing that, like for example, at, at Spotify scale, if you take some of that and you start applying, you will easily, quickly run into scale problems. You're going to run into things like, how do you do it over 600 million users? How are you going to do it over 100 million tracks, right? And those are the kind of applied problems that may not be counted for when, when the academic papers are written, right? That's what I mean when I say like, Research is good, but then reading the applied stuff takes you to the next level in terms of like visualizing that tech in a real business product. And as, as you start doing this more and more, I think interviews are going to become a breeze, right? Like when you go into these big tech interviews, it's going to be like, they're going to give you a system design problem, right? They're going to say like, build me Netflix homepage. And then you, you have already visualized this like several times through like different papers. I think it's going to be like a very easy task. So you mentioned like, for example, someone might say graph machine learning is the best for recommendations. So when you are looking at these like blogs or maybe even the cutting edge papers that come out, how do you recognize what's just hype versus like what's more here to stay? Because I think we're in this golden age of machine learning and AI right now where everything just seems like revolutionary, but then it's going to eventually shake out and you'll see what's, you know, what's real here to stay versus like, you know, what was just marketing. How do you determine what's what? I can answer at two levels. One is for, for the company Spotify and for myself, right? So, so for the company, I choose things that are fundamental in nature, which haven't changed in the last couple of years, right? So the example of that is say transformer models, right? So transformer models and the attention mechanism is here to stay at least for, for a while. And I see that being core piece of what NLNs are doing, right? So I'm not going to jump into some new like Mistral model or some like some of the latest thing because it will change like tomorrow, right? So I, I like to use these core concepts and build products from the ground up using those core technologies, right? So that is answering from my Spotify hat on, right? But on a personal level, I think the way I, I do it is I kind of like follow like multiple people and I, I take like what 80% of them are talking about. You try to like throw away some of those marketing stuff and you kind of start to like see what are the common patterns. And an example of this is things like LLMs evaluating other LLMs. That is a trend that is coming up again and again and again through multiple people in the industry one night. If you want to train your own LLM, how do you evaluate it? And you could either put a lot of humans on it or you could put another LLM which would evaluate your output. And what I'm hearing from a number of experts in the field is like LNM evaluating LNM is here to stay. In what form, we don't know, but that is here to stay, right? So that, that's what I mean when I say like, follow like the core idea from multiple people, multiple experts, but don't focus on specifics that like they may sell their own product. They may say like this for like LNM.ai, like this is the best thing in the world for evaluating LNM, right? But then that may change, but the core idea won't. So we talk a little bit about the kind of hard skills that you can develop to, to do well in this career. What are some, maybe not so much like technical skills for someone that might come from a, a background that they already have the hard skills, but like, what are some other additional skills or qualities to cultivate, to become like a successful machine learning engineer? Yep. I think there are a few things. Okay. One is communication skills with stakeholders, right? So this. I know a lot of engineers hear that and they're like, okay, uh, like, oh, that's obvious. Like that's soft skills. But to me, hard skills have a place which you need to be really good at, 
Like, obviously, I think otherwise we won't be in this conversation. So once you have really good hard skills, communicating and, and explaining your ideas and your vision and how ML can impact business is, I think, a very important thing. And that's what I see is the difference between a mid-level and a senior engineer. So hard skills are obviously important, right? But, but when I work in, at like companies like Spotify, all engineers are like actually really good. Everyone can do whatever they want. Like they're really, really good. Now, how do you actually differentiate between mid-level to senior to staff levels, right? It comes down to how assertive and how good you are at like taking in all of these different priorities and complexity, putting in your own idea and kind of communicating to the stakeholders what you mean. Right. And like, how do you learn it? So then the question is like, how do you learn it? Is it just being good at talking? Like, I think that helps, but that's not it. Right. You also need to understand the problem so deeply. And it's not just about the hard skills of building something. Right? I think a lot of engineers just want to build like this build and ship. But it's also about understanding it to an extent where you can explain all the trade-offs. Right. So it's not just about like, okay, I built a new LLM. But can you explain why this LLM is better than the other one, which is better than the third one? Can you explain th whether there are 17 other evaluation techniques? Why did you pick this one? As you start doing that, your communication style and your ability to communicate with stakeholders gets better. So yeah, what I, 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 I want to no. talk about that. I think, I think that's an important one, which is like, mm. it sounds like you're saying that the having soft skills, having great communication is not about the actual speaking, but about the preparation that mm. you have to mm. put into it before you even get to communicating yeah. it. So mm -hmm. I, w I would love to know more about like, how do you personally approach a problem so that you understand it so thoroughly that you can teach it and explain it to someone that might not be you know, nearly as technical or well-versed in the topic? Like, do you have an example or like walk us through your approach to solving or to fully understanding a problem? Yeah. So to me, like this one is, uh, I think it's also got to do with passion. I think when you really enjoy the problem, so you're not just looking for credit. Right. So a lot of communication, I think, well, I'm like, okay, I'm going to talk to a director level person and I'm going to like sell this person something about like my agenda. Like I have this cool idea. Let me just get it like approved or whatever. And I, I get to build it for the next three months. Right. But people will see through it. So I think it's also about kind of the passion on the problem. Like you truly like want to solve something. And then you try a number. So you now use your hard skills. You prototype a couple of things, right? So you get a true understanding of something. Then you talk with your colleagues and you kind of, you ask them to critique you, right? You want to be with people who critique you, right? You really want people who can like see through your BS very quickly, basically. So you'll want to remove those layers of selling, like that artificial layers you create, like where you're just like, this is the best thing in the world, right? You want to remove all of that, that selling thing. And then you get to the core idea, right? Like, Okay, so this is the thing. These are the trade-offs. And this is not a magic bullet. It can help us in certain way. It may not help us in certain way. And I think when you communicate it this way, like directors and, and other like senior leaders can see that yeah, you've put in the work and you are like open to both positives and negative aspects to your problem statements. And this way, they are able to like approve and they're able to like guide you and, and accept what you have to say. And I think this skill is a little bit undervalued. So when you ask me, like, switching to ML, right? So this skill can help you as a software engineer, as, as anyone, basically, right? So this is a general skill, but it kind of plays in a very important role from, at least from what I see when it comes to, like, promotion. Yeah, I think that's important. It sounds like you're talking almost like starting with the right mindset where you're not coming into to sell your idea or sell your, your, your solution. You're coming at it to try to understand all the trade-offs. And I think the important thing that shift that happens between junior, mid-level and, and, and eventually a senior level is that there is no like one right answer, uh, right? There is, I think there's like a, uh, when you think about the, the build and ship uh, mindset, there's always uh, this inclination that there's a right way to build this and let's just ship it. Like this is the right way to do it. But I think you're saying that uh, the more senior you become, the more you understand that there is no one right answer. But I think it's clear, it's important to be able to communicate all the trade-offs that are involved in the decision that you might make, which is never a perfect decision. Mm -hmm. yep. So I want to move on to something that you mentioned to us, which is that 
there's this myth that, you know, again, machine learning, I think it's in a, it's a the beginning of a golden age where everyone thinks that it's going to kind of solve everything. And you believe that that's a myth that it cannot solve everything. So tell us more about this, this myth that this kind of misconception that you hear, like what's realistic about what machine learning is capable of doing. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I agree that the myth is definitely there that ML is a solution or even now they call it AI, like AI is a solution to everything. And the reason I say this is a myth is because why it is amazing in a certain situation, right? So say, for example, to predict price of an Uber ride, yes, right? it, it's the very, very good thing. But there is more to it than just ML is a solution to everything, right? So for example, like when you ship an ML model, you need to monitor it, you need to productionize it, you need to like maintain it. You need to measure the drift. You need to see if it's still providing value. Is it introducing bias? If it's introducing bias, how do you mitigate it? Is it degrading in value over time? So like, those are some of those things which are a little bit like less sexy and, and they're a little bit more traditional, right? So there is a lot of traditional aspects to this process. And in fact, it's much more tougher than traditional, right? Traditional is like you unit test and you, you monitor, it's all good. But in this case, you need to do those things, but then you also need to check data distribution, you need to check bias. Like these are some of the like things that are really important, which if you don't think through, uh, MN is not a solution for the problem. So for someone that is looking to break into this field, what is the interview process like? Tell us more about, you mentioned earlier about, you might get a system design question mm -hmm. to design the recommendation feed for Netflix, for example, or something that might involve ML, but what else is involved in the interview process? Yeah. So in terms of interview process, uh, it can, it varies from company to company, right? And, and as, and in the beginning, I said there were two parts, right? One is a startup path and one is a big tech path, right? So let's start with the big tech first, because I think that's more established, right? And in the big tech parts, typically you will have like one or two coding questions where you will be asked to like do some kind of lead code style, like programming, pair programming thing. And this to me, I think most of the listeners should be familiar with this, right? Like going to lead code and do some practice. I think it's hard to avoid doing this. And I, I see a lot of people in the industry being frustrated and a little bit like angry about the whole like the lead code style uh, thing. And my answer to that thing is that I agree. I agree with the sentiment that a lot of this like dynamic programming, backtracking, like a lot of those things may not be applied day to day as a machine learning practitioner, but it's more about problem solving. Like, so as long as you've got the algorithms and, and the, all those stacks and linear algebra, like all of those fundamentals, which little practice, it should be okay. And many times I've seen that in pair programming, interviewers are very helpful actually. Like there is a myth that, that interviewers are just sitting there and like judging you and they are like handing out scores from one to 10, like whether this person is good or not, right? And that's not the case. From what I've seen, like in most big tech companies, people actually want you to succeed in that interview and they will help you out. So they will actually kind of like guide you along. And as long as you kind of listen to their feedback, like you will be able to overcome some of the challenges, right? Then in the ML side, I see there are typically like two or three interviews on ML system design, which I mentioned earlier, you would build an end-to-end -end ML problem from scratch. Second thing I've seen is ML prep, where they will ask you to kind of present alternate ML models. So like decision trees, random forest, neural networks, and you kind of like discuss trade-offs of each one, which loss functions, which ones are better for overfitting, underfitting. And so, you know, they're kind of like seeing whether like you're able to like see the whole picture rather than just take like, oh, they, I like this model because I've used it yesterday and I, you just want to use it. So they want to kind of see how wide you can go. And then there might be another round on depth, which is more about taking like one model and going very deep, right? So can you actually build a custom loss function? Can you compile? Can you like build layers? Can you think of? So this is an option I've not seen in all, all companies, but this may be another interview you encounter, right? Then you will have a behavioral round where, which is very common, I think people are aware of it, is they will ask for your resume experience and projects and kind of want you to explain them in detail. This is kind of the, the landscape kind of I see uh, with internet. So what we're starting to see is that there is a lot more demand right now for machine learning engineers and that's growing. And I think we're starting to see too that they're starting to get paid slightly more than let's say a more of a generalist software engineer. Can you say more about like why you think this is the case? Like why is there a shift today? 
Yeah, I think it's also a little bit because some of the machine learning engineers need a unicorn style of, of skills, right? And it may change in the future, but at the moment right now, MLDs, you need to understand data. You need to know how to process features. In big tech, you may even need to do distributed uh, data work, right? So you may have data engineers, but you're still supposed to oversee them, right? So that's data. Then there is core ML, which is your expertise. Like, can you build models from that? Can you extract information? Can you evaluate? Can you ship? Then there is communication we talked about uh, just a few minutes back. And then there is also kind of this whole EB testing, shipping product mindset, which you also need to bring in. Right? So it's, it's basically like going from data, ML, productionization, monitoring, evaluation, and then communication as well as product. Right? So it's, it's a fairly large breadth of skills that you need and you need to also maybe go into depth in a few of them so that's why there is a there is a uh, which many companies are not able to fill if someone out there is a friend or a family member or, or a colleague that is not in a, a machine learning engineer that wants to break into the space how do you help them understand if it's the right career move for them or not how do you make sure that how do you make sure that it's going to be a good fit for them or not yeah two points here one is that ml is not for everyone the reason I'm going to give two reasons, right? One is that there is an inherent randomness and inconsistency in ML, right? And it's not for everyone, right? Some people prefer that you build and you ship and that's it. You know, go peacefully sleep at night, move to a new problem, right? ML is not that. ML is going to be very cyclic and iterative. You may build the best model in the world, right? You may even ship it but it may still fail for individual prediction, right? So there may be an angry customer and you don't know why. Like there may be reasons like it fails for this new user in Slovakia for this particular key. You are not anticipating it. And it happens all the time, right? It happens all the time. And it's not for everyone, right? It, you need a certain ownership mindset. You need a certain kind of this artistic mindset, in fact, like, you know, where, where you're like, you don't have a perfect solution. You're okay kind of coming up compromises and coming up with something that is like a decent art, right? So, so to me, like, that's not for everyone. And second is, like I said, end-to-end -end understanding of the whole stack. Right? For some people, they don't want to do it. Like, they actually just want to maybe build iOS apps and, and call it, right? And, and that's fine. I mean, I really respect, but... But for some others, they're like, no, I want to see the whole stack. I want to like think of problems with product. I want to communicate. I want to like work with data scientists, data. And if you are that, then then maybe this is for you, right? So these are the two things to think about. If you want to jump into ML, I wouldn't recommend it just for the higher salary or because it's cool, because five years later, it may not be cool. It's possible there may be something else, right? So yeah. then, you'll, then you might want to just jump to that thing. So in that sense, like, when you answer these two questions, you're basically like checking if you really enjoy it to like last at it for the long run. Yeah, I think that's important to highlight the the, the kind of um, potential downsides of becoming a machine learning engineer, which is like you mentioned that you can't have a perfect solution for everybody. And I think that's something that some people can do fine with, but sometimes people might have a hard time grappling with this idea that you're not going to be able to have a perfect solution that fixes it for all edge cases. What, what what about what, is there something out there that or something that you wish you had known or wish you knew before becoming a machine learning engineer? I wish I had maybe formed these groups of people interested in different aspects of ML to be a peer group. I think so. I did start forming peer group much later on when I was established in the industry. But I think I would what advice I was giving earlier with like having two three people to read stuff with. That is way faster than just going at it alone. So I did a lot of things individually alone, like self-learning, self. So it takes way more effort. It's it's much more difficult. So I think I think I would I would form a group, and to me that's half the battle. I think you, I think if if we can just do that, I think that that would that's kind of what I what I would tell myself if I was starting alone. Yeah, because you, you have insight into th this field, your work in this field, how do you, and you, you understand the potential of machine learning and, and let's say AI, how do you see machine learning and AI playing a role in the future for software engineers and machine learning engineers like careers? Is it as much of a threat as like the news puts out or is it complete opposite end where we're completely overestimating the potential of AI and machine learning in the, in the career path? What are your thoughts here? 
Yeah, I can dig deep into this particular point. I fought through this at different levels. I think at a very high level, I think it is here to stay. Right, like the kind of core generation that that LLMs can now do is is getting scarily good. Right, it's getting better and better every day. Right, so it's here to stay as an augmentative tool. So I'm I'm thinking like software engineers and MLEs won't go away anytime soon, at least in the next decade. Uh, but some of these tools will be more and more crucial for augmentation purposes. Right, so you don't need to read API docs as much. So you ask this tool like. Okay, I'm trying to integrate with this tool called Optimizely for doing A-B testing. Can you just help me call like Python client and and set up set me up like a mock script to call their their client or whatever? And this LLM should be able to do it pretty pretty easy, right? So the time that it took you to read API docs to do that would have been like a week. Now it's just a day, right? So then I'm I'm expecting us to see more of that thing, but. Coming to what there might be listeners here who might be choosing their fields, right? And to me, one of the fields which is like at the greatest danger of getting disrupted by LLMs and AI is a field of data analyst. Right? That's one of the fields, at least in the domain of data science and ML. I'm not going to go outside this domain, but in this domain, data analyst to me feels like someone you would have to think really like a lot about because what's happening, what I'm seeing now is Executives want answers, right? And data analysts typically provide those answers. I'm seeing more and more companies coming up which are able to look at your data, structured and unstructured, and answer the questions for executives through just like a chatbot interface or through some other means, right? And slowly what's going to happen is you might have 20 data analysts in your, in your company, they will start to get reduced. So that's an example of a job that is likely to get disrupted, right? Where Simple code generation and answer is enough, but there are jobs with software engineers and MLEs who are end to end, like full stack, like which need complex decision state offs. I don't think they are going to be disrupted anytime soon. That's a very good insight. I hadn't considered that any job where you can kind of just get answers can be potentially replaced right now by some kind of chat interface, like you had mentioned. So thank you so much for your time, Sankit, who is a senior machine learning engineer at Spotify. Thanks so much for coming on, sharing your journey, your experience, and your advice with us. Thanks for having me. Great to, have, great to be here.